Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations That Matter in the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi Hörnlein and I'm the co-founder of the Wisdom Factory. I'm here in beautiful Italy, although it's this year is a little bit dry and hopefully we will have enough water in, in summer, but anyway, it's nice here. So today we want to talk again about an integral topic. We want to be curious, how can integral be seen? It's really inquiry into integral. And my guest today is Jeremy Johnson. Say hello, Jeremy. Hi, Heidi. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have known you. And I wonder if at the beginning, as I don't know too much about you yet, that you can introduce yourself to the people. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we, we connected for the first time through the recent teleconference, right, on, uh, yes. on Dharma and Conflict, uh, which was a really, really wonderful series of, of lectures. Um, and we had these breakout sessions, and I think that's how I got started. We, we wanted to, we had a great little breakout group, and we ended up sitting there for, I think we were there for an hour. You know, we were supposed to be there for 15 minutes, but the conversation was just great and back and forth. And uh, we ended up chatting for about an hour about all sorts of things. So um, as I've been saying, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to connect with the community and, and, and see a very vibrant and active and, and uh, horizontal space where everybody's kind of gathering and having these conversations. And those are the best parts of the, the conferences in the integral community that I've been to in terms of um, actually having people getting together between the lectures and, and congregate in the in the, um, you know, the watering hole and, and, and talk with each other and come up with ideas and projects together. Those are, those are the most memorable moments. So again, really cool and really exciting that you have this space that's really all about that. So um, yeah, so I'm a little bit about my, about my background. So I'm a writer, I'm an editor. I've done some work with a couple of different sort of consciousness culture media spaces like Reality Sandwich. Um, they're kind of a New York based magazine media company. And I've been interested in integral as, as a subject for, you know, over 10 years now, I think, you know, I'm 32. And I really kind of dived into it very, very early college years. So 18, 19. Um, and I've just been just a voracious, um, voraciously curious about these subjects, reading Tehard and Wilbur and Gepser and Aurobindo and, and, and thinking about um, how all of that kind of applies in the present. And um, with my own kind of research and scholarship, I've really kind of focused on Gebser. So I, I just recently published Seeing Through the World through Revelor Press. And that's a kind of an introduction to Gebser's version of Integral. Um, it's, it's a little different than Wilbur's in, in some pretty fundamental ways. Um, so I've been really been trying to bring that forward into the cultural conversation because I think it integral in general and then Gebser as well and many of these thinkers have so much insight to what's happening right now. So that's kind of me in a nutshell, just sort of an integral researcher and a passionate learner, um, reader about all of these topics. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad that people like you, so young people, dive into this uh, into this mindset you know i was much older when i think i was 40 or something when i came across verba but it was an eye-opening thing and it gave so gave so many explanations to what i just couldn't understand about the world you know and then it ah yeah sure you know it was something like somebody giving words to what you intuit but you cannot really grasp it and then came along ken Wilber and i said so it is. And since then, I was passionate. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. really, no, it's a bit over 20 years now that I'm really engaged in integral and go to the German integral, because I'm German, German integral meetings. And then since the European conferences went on in Hungary, I'm always there. So no, it's, it's really, really great. And mm -hmm. I do think that integral thought, I mean, Ken Wilber has brought these things together, but he is also based on Gebser and also Aurobindo and these people. Um, I think that's, that's what can save the world, if you want to say that, that uh, people who grow into this mindset have 
potentially the capacity of find solutions for the problems we have. And so in my uh, opinion, it's so important that more people grow up into this uh, way of seeing the world, way of thinking, way of doing, so that enough people are there who can take over the leadership and, and do something really <laughs> better than what is happening now. So it's your generation who needs to do that. And I'm glad that so really many people lately I knew, so many people are much, much, much younger than I was when I entered into that. So I have here my cat that it's, come on. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> he, oh. is, he is crazy. <laughs> I have to take him off. Come on. Very sweet. <laughs> yeah. I have I have two cats now, so yeah, it's good. So. I have five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they are, yeah, you know, that's somebody to, to care for also, no? When when life is a little bit difficult and you have uh, animals, you cannot allow yourself to be in bed the whole day or something. No. You have to get up and do and be Somebody's there. Somebody's hungry some... in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's good. That's good. So let's inquire a little bit into Integral. I know mainly Ken Wilber quite well. The latest books I haven't really devoured anymore as I did the, the first 15 years, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your, if there is somebody who has never heard about Integral, what, what would you in five minutes maybe tell them what Integral is and not necessarily will be an integral. It's your understanding of, of uh, integral right. thought. And yeah. Oh, that's good. That's a good question. Oh, um, yeah. I know. I think I could sum it up maybe, maybe in a minute or two. <laughs> but I think I, well, mm, that the most interesting part of that, right, when you're approaching somebody who's never heard of any of these topics at all, um, might be kind of appealing to their sense of history and kind of going, oh, hey, you, you know how there have been these sort of moments in history, and they can span 100 years or so or, or longer, where everything started to change, where, you know, the art started getting different, the sciences started getting different, we had these kind of revolutions in thinking and organizing ourselves, and we can see that in history, we've seen it happen. Well, that's happening right now, and so that's what Integral is interested in, these transformations. And, and how culture reorients itself, how we have a new sense of, of identity and, and, a, and a new sense of world and how that, that the, the, the subject, you know, the person, the individual, um, how they relate to not only each other, but also how they relate to the world and how they see the world being structured. You know, um, how do they experience time and space and, and, and identity and, um, the gods or perhaps the non-gods if they're more atheistic or, or secular. These transformations are always happening. So that's it. As I would say, like there's there's something going on right now that is one of those transformations. Um, and one of those kind of pivotal moments similar to the Renaissance. But there's these new values that are trying to crop up. And I would say, you know, they're more networked oriented, more connective, more um, kind of envisioning and sort of connecting the dots between all of these different systems of knowledge, right? So it's more of that relational, more connective, and then it's also this kind of whole-oriented style of thinking, like thinking in the whole, right? Of envisioning or imagining the whole. Um, and then kind of looking back on everything and seeing, you know, this sort of meta-awareness, I guess, of, of an awareness of change, an awareness that change continues to happen and take place. So I think that that would be like my nutshell, like elevator, oh, what do you do? What is this integral thing? That's sort of what, really what it is. For me, it's a study, and, but I think, um, obviously, you know, we could go into, well, there's people doing all these cool things, and, you know, here's this integral approach to uh, to medicine or um, to to organizations and these kinds of stuff, and they're all trying to track that and and lean into it a little bit to to give it more momentum and clarity. Um, so, okay, I do know yeah. the devil's advocate and ask you, but what do you mean? It's changing. It's all getting worse. It's all chaos. So, uh -huh. what what is your <laughs> integral people saying about that? We, we are almost, you know, uh, everything, it's more expensive and uh, it's no rain or it's too much rain. And um, 
What what is in, what 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 that's <laughs> That's a good question. And that's something that's on the tip of everyone's tongues right now, too. Just like this general attitude that, um, well, it's overwhelming. You know, I think people are overwhelmed today. And when they react like that, they're, 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 they're coming from a genuine place of feeling that everything, the systems, the values in their culture have let them down, right? That there's, there's a failure to take off into this new. And I'm, we're describing our goals. Wow, this is transformation, and they're just seeing it as this. There's this implosion, but I think they're both true. You know, the they're both happening at the same time, and that that is the nature of a lot of these leaps. Like Gebser calls them leaps, mutations. Um, there, there's a breakdown of the way in which we're organizing ourselves. It doesn't work anymore, and we keep doing it, so it works less and less and less and less. And so we're seeing it systemically. We're seeing this sort of systemic breakdown of styles of thinking that are failing us. Um, and people are still reinforcing it because of just, it's just sort of, it's a habit, it's a pattern, it's a structure. And we we see that across many different cultures, many different civilizations. So totally right to feel that, right? You're totally, it's totally okay to feel that. But, but you know, there are some ways that we can mitigate that crisis by trying to empower things that are helpful and are good and are novel and, and nascent in terms of like this new integral culture, this new, um, a perspectival world. So that's what I always say, especially because I have friends who are, who are kind of, it's all going downhill now, right? Um, and I, you know, I, I, I sympathize with them in a very deep way, but I think it's even more crucial right now to lean into right the, the the possibilities and the new structures of organizing society. The you know I can give up I give examples all the time like um, Douglas Rushkoff. Uh, I think we were talking about that in the last uh, our last discussion or at least brought it up at some point. This whole idea of team human. Uh, you know there's there's all of these different projects that are trying to address the crisis head on and find solutions. And so you, you always look at the crisis points to find those solutions, to know, okay, all right, global warming's happening, climate's changing, et cetera. The weather's getting weird. Well, why is that? And what is it about our style of thinking and enacting civilization that has been playing into that? And how can we change it? And what are the organizations that are changing it? What are the styles of thinking that are more relational and ecological? Like, there are plenty of ways to plug into things that make you feel a little bit more empowered than than disempowered, right, and powerless. I think what you are saying uh, points to the fact that we are not sitting around and uh, try to invent cars which have less carbon emission, but we think more generally about all these things. Yes, cars without carbon emission is very good, but there are many other uh, moments which play into the problems of this uh, this period. And so I think from the integral perspective is trying to get the really bigger picture mm -hmm. and from there maybe then go down and find single solutions but not the other way around which now all these uh, groups protest against this protest against that which is sort of good but it's not enough true but partial <laughs> what Campbell always said no so what I feel that integral is trying to do is really coming from a bigger picture from a also a uh, possibility as you said mm -hmm. and uh, putting also history in in perspective in the sense that learning from history instead of uh, thinking that uh, that's everything new now and uh, integral thought is uh, very much uh, focused on before or when a new structure arises the old has to break down necessarily you know and then mm -hmm when it goes well, then the old, old things get uh, integrated in the, in the new uh, structures, which is not always working too well. But anyway, so out of crisis, something new can happen. Something new would never happen if there was no crisis, because we exactly. as humans are sort of lazy <laughs> when things work. <laughs> Why should we need you change? No push. push, yeah. Um, as, as Gebster says, some, uh, within the dissolution, there is a solution. And he's playing with the words, but, nice. you know, it's that idea that, you know, integral to any crisis is its transformation. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we're doing, I think, as practitioners.
uh, it's really trying to hone in what those two things are, what the crisis really is, and then what what the solution to the dissolution is. Um, and you know, I think we we can get more specific about values. I mean, uh, you know, like Rushkoff talks about. There's there, there's it's okay to look back, and this is the, the 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 power I think in being having a sense of awareness of these transformations. It's that you know there are certain enactments of culture and value systems that we can retrieve in the integral that have been lost or have been sort of cut off um, or have been sort of placed to the side for other values. So um, there are a lot of people critiquing the economic, the industrial, the ecological problems because they, they're all constellated around this sort of value system of instrumentality, um, kind of a dehumanization, right? As much as like the West and industrialism and capitalism has been this kind of um, uh, liberation of the mercantile class from the kind of the, the, the static order of the medieval period, right? And the sort of new um, um, endless kind of growth and, and self-actualization for these new, um, this new merchant, these new merchant class. Um, it's also been, you know, there's a limit to that, you know, there's a moderation that has to take place. And I think the integral kind of sees that, that this sort of immoderation that we've developed since the Renaissance period, since modernity, there's a great there's great values in that, but they have to be placed alongside some of the other values that we've sort of lost. So again, like Rushkoff talks about, and I think it's similar to Integral in, in Gebser, um, this whole idea of reclaiming the commons, right? Reclaiming these collective communal spaces where people are coming together, like we're doing right now, like we're building on the internet, but then also how do we build those systems that nourish people that feed people you know that decentralize these power structures but keep them still in some form of organization some form of network so i think we're reclaiming a lot of these values as as rushkoff says um he has this fun way of thinking like okay a renaissance is a rebirth the modernity was a rebirth of some of these old greek values maybe we need to go back to the notion of the commons and rehumanizing principles in terms of, you know, the value of the soul and of the human being, um, instead of sort of turning them into an algorithm, you know, those kinds of things. Maybe we need to reclaim that. And in another sense, like reclaim the meaning of Renaissance so that it's not just the individualist capitalist oriented growth perspective, but then, but now no, it's a kind of a collectivist commons, you know, bringing everybody into this perspective. These are the values that we kind of need right now in terms of how to how to make this transition. So, you know, I think as, as part of what we're talking about, um, values are, are a very important topic in terms of like, what are we retrieving? What are we trying to balance, right? What are we trying to, um, how are we trying to integrate that and move it into a better, a better future, a better tomorrow? So. Yeah, values are very important. And uh, mainly also the values of the individual and short, surely individual is embedded in the social surrounding. And so it's also the group values. But, you know, as long as we allow our leaders to express values, which are, let's say, mildly not the best ones <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for human existence and, and for our well-being and thriving on, on the planet, um, then it is a little bit of a problem, no? Mm -hmm. And integral theory, can Weber theory uh, also uh, turn back with a spiral dynamics says clearly that people in their personal development always go from one set of values to the next set of values, you know? And so um, what is important is what we often do not to do is when you go to the next value, to completely dismiss the values you had before, like for instance, community, no? Uh, before it was a community value that we cared for each other and then it's only money making alone and I'm, you know, it's all about me. Um, so with other words, not bringing the new emerging values to an excessive, uh, exaggerated point, as you already said and include the previous values. And this is, uh, for me, it's the problem which has happened. Nothing is wrong with going from values, one value setting to the next one, but 
you know, not denigrate. And that seems to be the, the I, I think, I don't know if Gebser says that too, but Wilber says that that is the first tier at attitude uh, that everybody thinks the others are great, uh, mad. You know, only what I think and what I believe is right. And what you believe, oh, no, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you must be crazy or something like this. So the dismissal of the uh, of the values of the other people because we think we are higher developed and so we have better values. We, we have, you know, in some way, seen in a certain way. But that doesn't mean that we are better when we are... Uh, grown up at the ladder. What we need to do is to, to integrate what we have learned and then use that if it's better values, for instance, doing something for, you know, for nature or for community and then, and then put it into practice and do it instead of complaining about this, they are happening and this is the capitalism, this is patriarchy and, you know, somebody to blame that doesn't lead anywhere. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's some. Um, you know, Gebster doesn't have as much of. Uh, you know, he was he, he was writing before I think before back. Um, well, definitely before back. Yeah. And definitely before Graves in the forties. I think Graves wasn't writing yet in the forties. But um, at any rate, uh, you know, his his thinking. He's where you know where Wilbur got the archaic magic mythic mental that he's been using since the the eighties. Um, and, and in that phase of his writing. And, but for Gebser, they were not developmental. And here's the interesting thing. This is always a, sort of the point of departure, but it's also kind of easy to, to understand with Gebser. Um, each of the structures, they kind of, they have a little bit of an unfolding in terms of like, you know, archaic is zero dimensional and the magic is, is one. And then the mythical is two dimensional. And then the mental is what you would think. It's this sort of three dimensional material space, right? Um, but each of them have a kind of locus point with their, you know, as he says, a phenomenology, which is just sort of the study of being. Like, what is it, what is it like to be in the world for you? You know, what, what is your center of gravity? How, how do you relate to the world? What's your experience of yourself? And then also, what's your experience of time and space? You know, is, is, are you in a kind of a timeless now? Is time a cycle, part of, you know, the archetypal drama of the seasons and the gods that are kind of moving through you and you're participating? These are the kind of worlds that we used to really live in. These are kind of our centers of gravity. Um, so he kind of sees each of these structures as these sort of deep, these deep um, ruts or, or grooves in the human being and that's sort of relating to the world in a very deep, profound way. And we move out of them and, and, and into them according to, you know, if they become efficient or deficient or they kind of break down, there's some new problems in the world that we need to res respond to with a new structure. Um, so a little bit different, but not, nevertheless, you know, I think the whole idea for any of their transformations, is, it, it's this concept of retraction, which is all the problems you see out in the world, they have to do with the structure of, of your being. So, Yes, we can talk about capitalism, as you're mentioning, and, and industrialization and problems about economics and, and class and all of those things are real. Um, but the way you actually solve those problems is tracing what your consciousness is doing to bring them out in the first place. All of those things are enacted by human beings, right? They're, they're enacted by us. They're created by us because we have a center of gravity. We have certain values. We see the world a certain way, and then we project that out, and, and we see the world that way, and we enact a world that way. So the question is kind of how can I trace capitalism and um, climate change and everything else back into myself as a human being? What are the value systems that, and the orientations, the structures of consciousness that are behind these things that I am participating in? Um, so it's always a kind of a looking out at the world and then kind of tracing that and looking into the self and then kind of going, what is... What is our orientation? How can we change that? If we change that, then yes, we'll change, we'll change those problems everywhere you know, that we see around us by taking back and retracting those, those issues into ourselves. So um, that's how I've always kind of seen it, is this kind of beautiful interplay between the self and the world you know, and kind of seeing through both and, and always asking ourselves, is this sort of the magic at work or the mythic? You know, or how are these things at play with one another? Um, and then our situation right now with everything that's going on is kind of a culture war and a sort of fragmentation. 
it is it's such a um very specifically uh, it's it's such a mental perspectival problem right the mental we're all familiar with this the mental is really good at sort of spatializing and dividing and segmenting and 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 categorizing something and and it's very good at opposing a thing right there's 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 me and then there's you there's this opinion and there's that opinion right or wrong and then you enter this dialectic and you debate about it and you figure it out and there's a third thing but it keeps turning it's always turning so the the, the mental today is a sort of again this thing that's in out of moderation again right it's it's the mental is really good at dividing but it's we've gotten to the point where now everybody has their own little totalizing worldview and they don't listen to anybody else and and there's no more there's no more spatial ground to kind of go, here's what's real. So now there's this talk of the post-truth world, right? Where everybody has their own truth. Um, and the internet's kind of engendered that. It's kind of made that easier in certain ways. So this is like our question of fragmentation, right? And, and how do we, these aren't just abstract ideas. They're like lived realities. How do we talk to each other on the internet? Why can't we? What's going on with this culture war? And what does that say about how our own consciousness is fragmented. If we're having so much difficulty relating to one another, what's going on with us? Why are we, what, what are these divides here for? And how are we building them, right? This is always that question, bring it back into us. So anyway, I, I could ramble about this for a while. And yeah. obviously my camera here through to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nice, a white one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you have an, a practical example how you, for, uh, I don't know, climate change or capitalism mm -hmm. or patriarchy, where you can explain better the, the back and forth between what is out there and what is uh, your view of the world and your, probably also your psychological reality. So, mm. Mm. Um, so one, I mean, gosh, uh, okay, so it really kind of gets, it really have to like understand what is the, the mental structure as it relates to us as human beings, right? So we, we all take it for granted. We feel ourselves to be this person with a name, with an ego, with a sense of self, with desires that very in, in our society, very individualistic. What's your career? You know, what are you doing? What, what are your favorite books? What are your favorite music? What's your, your sense of style and fashion, right? You're part of society, but all of us feel this sense of individuality. Um, that's, that's sort of, you know, a, a good place to start, I think, with the mental orientation. This is the, the great achievement of mental consciousness, is this sense of autonomy and selfhood, right? Ha being a waking being that's reflecting on the, themselves and their own nature and their own qualities um, with a sense of a journey through life. You know, how am I growing? How am I evolving? How am I developing? Um, so that's all fine. But, but uh, Gebser talks about the kind of underlying, I think Wilbur talks about this too in terms of, you know, autonomy and self-sense and self-identity and ego, the development of the ego. Um, the, 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 the phenomenological aspect of this when you get to the root of that that self-sense what is your orientation well think about the renaissance artists and they studied it and they they, they encapsulated perfectly i guess talks about this too in terms of the development of perspective um you're an ego or a subject standing in a three-dimensional space three-dimensional measurable scientific reality wake the waking world with your eyes looking at the horizon um a sense of a subject with objects around you in this material space. That's kind of our fundamental orientation, right? We're literary beings, yes, but even the, the literature is sort of a subjective individual, individualizing thing. So an individual moving through space with a self sense of separation, a good one, that's our starting point. And I think we are, we're all there and we all have that. Uh, Gebser saying that like, okay, when you take that out of moderation, the mental itself even the word mental right it means if you trace the etymology to it, it means wrath it means directedness it means moving across space so even our word mental has this kind of oh yeah let the, the emerging subject that awakens to itself that's moving across space because it wants something it, it desires an object it wants to oppose an object it's kind of a very embattled it's a kind of a kind of a very warfare oriented kind of thing a thing that goes forth on the battlefield and goes 
to, to achieve something, to fight something, etc. So this is our, this is the fundamental thing we've been developing for the past few thousand years, right? And we've gotten really good at it now. We're really good at developing egos and subjects and a sense of self-separation. And, and so that, that's what I, I would say, like, okay, how do we get a sense of that? But how does that relate to climate change? Well, if you take that out of moderation, if you are just the ego, if you're just the waking mind with no other connection to the other structures, um, then you begin to kind of lose a sense of participation and connection. You begin to only be that ego that goes forth towards its objects of opposition or desire in space. And if you are only that, then you become this kind of all-consuming perspectival eye that just kind of wants to go and, 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 and objectify things and measure things. And the mental is really good at measurement. It's really good at dividing and categorization. It's masterful at that. It, it, that's where we get our empirical science from. That's where we get the kind of contemporary world from. This sort of fundamental capacity to be wakeful and to use the eye to cut space, to cut up the kind of mythical, imaginal realities that we used to very masterfully also participate in. We're not good at that anymore. We're good at measuring space, the scientific method, and dividing and cutting and measurement, very precise spatial measurement that has a limitation. You know, that's not the end all be all, right? I, I feel this is sort of relates to everything that's going on with ecology today because the mental can ultimately only separate. It, it can only cut and divide and measure further um, to the point where, you know, we've kind of narrowed ourselves down into our, our own unique point of view, POV, like the Renaissance artist doing a painting. But if everybody is just that, if, if that's that in in moderation, then we're all going to begin to feel alienated from one another. The world is going to be increasingly material. We're going to lose that sense of the spiritual. Um, if we keep dividing immoderately, then yeah, we're going to feel cut off and we're going to feel separated. And yeah, our systems of knowledge, they're going to be less and less connected to the whole. So yeah, problems like climate change start to show up because we're not thinking about the whole anymore. We're thinking about the part. The part has become totalized. And it's for somebody to think about this in terms of their own experience, just think about the last time you had a fight on Facebook, you know, this sort of not being able to talk to each other. You're, you're right there. You see each other's avatars and there's just this gap. There's this sort of abyss between, you know, this perspective and your perspective. That's the, that's the mental world that's kind of run itself down in terms of it's it's now we now we need the integral because the integral can help us connect again we were the mental was really good at separation because that was part of even in wilbur's language that was part of the development that's part of the emergence of consciousness so now we need a connective form right so anyway i, I could keep rambling but that's sort of the feel of it you know, this self-separate sense and then everything that goes along with that, just from fighting on Facebook to ecological problems to, um, you know, what everyone's talking about today with a, a new sense of ecology and networks like Gregory Bateson, right? He always talks about that. The way we're thinking and relating to the world is fundamentally cut off from the world. So it's not going to work. We need a new style of science. We need a new style of thinking and relating. Um, so what comes yeah. to my mind while you are uh, talking, that's the fundamental difference between our sensory uh, organs. The eye is dissecting, is dividing, and the ear is connecting and putting together. And we have put so much, so much, exaggeratedly much emphasis on, on the picture, on seeing. So mm -hmm. it's no wonder that we are dissecting because we have lost the capacity of, of listening. Even acoustics as a science, they use um, uh, how do you say, visual uh, graphs and everything. And there is uh, big evidence that the ear has much more potential than the eye has. The ear you cannot fool as, as easily as you can fool the eyes. So mm -hmm. in my opinion, this is probably one of the underlying reasons why we went that road, because we use the eyes and think what we see is important, what we hear is 
not so important. And even, I mean, I'm now talking about the youth culture with this loud music. We are deafening our ears. So the capacity uh, of listening gets worse and worse. And what we need is listening to each other. Even what you say on Facebook, this is not listening. This is just fighting even if it's written yeah. <laughs> and not acoustic, but you could listen to what the others say and uh, absorb it in some way and then, you know, find a common ground or something. Instead, our habit is bang. I am against you. What you say is wrong. And, and I, I, I have lost the, um, any inspiration to go on Facebook and, and write mm -hmm. things. For me, it's talking in this way. What we are doing is so much different because we see each other, but we also hear each other. We hear the tone of the voice. We hear, you know, every mm -hmm. other communication, not every, but many communication uh, clues we have, which in the written language and, or in, even in graphs and things like that, it's not there. So I think we to come into, let's say, into integral would be to develop a culture of listening again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of the, the title. I don't know too much about it yet. I'm just still learning about it. This movement of metamodernism that's been going on on the internet recently. Um, Hansi Freinach is the author, and his the title of his book is The Listening Society, as this kind of emerging form of, of um, value in terms of listening. So I just like the name. I, 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 I resonate with the name of the book um, as this sort of new principle. Um, you know, this also reminds me, just to kind of layer that, that the subject a little bit, um, this also really reminds me of what Marshall McLuhan talked about with electronic culture. And he was writing about this again as well, very early on in, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, he wrote a number of books that, that skyrocketed, him, skyrocketed him into fame. Um, he's a Canadian, uh, English teacher, English professor, who started writing about media, right? And, and many of us know the medium is the message, but the, the important thing that he talked about was that electronic culture is intrinsically acoustic. It's about, and he studied the evolution. He has his own kind of v, uh, version of the evolution of consciousness through studying media. Um, but he says, you know, the pre-literate societies before language was cut up into an alphabet and into a script and abstracted into print, human beings were very embodied. Language was, it was an extremely embodied way of engaging. It was acoustic, it was hearing, it was posture and drama, it was kind of theatrics and poetry and the bardic mm -hmm. tradition. Um, it had a kind of a, a sacral preliterate capacity to have the hold the whole in itself in a kind of an acoustic round. Gebser talks about the same thing with the magical structure of consciousness to, to, and again, the language, right? In German, uh, I don't, you would probably know this better, but he talks about Gehorren to hear and, and, and hor, or he, Horen is to hear, right? And then Gehorren means to belong. So there's this connection between hearing and belonging. Um, okay, good. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So there's, yeah, there are all these connections here, but belonging, hearing, connecting, listening, the, this sort of acoustic shared space, which enables us to have a kind of a more multi, multimodal sense of presencing. Um, it's really important. And I think, you know, as moderns that have become more abstracted with these amazing innovations in technology and consciousness, and again, the dividing, you know, the alpha, the Greek alpha, alphabet, McLuhan describes it the same way Gebser describes the mental and the perspectival. It cuts up space. It cuts up that kind of acoustic sacred space into language. And now you can do new things with it. But it comes at a price. There's a gain and there's a loss. And the whole idea with, with McLuhan with electronic culture was that now, and this is before the internet, but he was saying now we've kind of created this global village and now the sense of acoustics returns. So the whole human being has to participate in the medium of communication again, not just our heads, not just our language and abstraction, not just book culture, but speaking. I think that's why podcasts are so popular now. It's like we move back into this different mode of communication that we've, we're retrieving now in a new form. Um, and of course, you know, I don't, I don't, to avoid the pre-trans fallacy stuff, I think McLuhan and Gepser were saying, it's not just kind of going back. We're, we're retrieving it in a new conscious way. We're not going to lose 
book culture and texts and abstraction and all of those gains of civilization that we worked on for the past few thousand years, they've, they've, we've really developed them masterfully, but now they need to be brought back into balance with these other aspects of being human, right? So, um, yeah, I think there's so many connections mm -hmm. with what you're saying. Really what we're seeing and all of these different integral scholars and if, if they even call themselves integral, like McLuhan wouldn't necessarily. And yet he's talking about this, about today. Yeah. Um, it seems to be a, a task of integral, let's say folks, integral level to do sort of a healing of what has been left out in the, in the first uh, six levels of development. I'm using now spiral dynamics of Ken Wilber. Uh, because as Ken Wilber said, every moment when these transitions of which you talked right at the beginning happen, something can go wrong. And then something will be left out, which actually would have been a big value to, to preserve it. And if it has left out, it's like in human psychology, when we have uh, missed some stages in our development or something went wrong, then we have more or less the possibility later to go back and heal that. And I think integral is meant to heal all these, um, I don't want to call it shortcomings, these things which were left out and which would have been needed to preserve instead, you know? Yeah, yes. Uh, it's, it's um, and this is why I like Gepser's approach in particular because, um, they're, I wouldn't say they're all on, an, on a flat plane, they're all even, the structures. They, they have a dimensionality to them. There's kind of a shape and a feel and a, a morphology to them that I can't really explain in, in rational words. But at the same time, they, they're all kind of, co as Gepser says, they're all co-present in us. The archaic, the magic, the mythic, the mental, even the integral. They're all, they all make us up presently. They're not something that's divided away from us in the past or the future. They're actually all latent in us in some way in the present. So it really kind of helps us go, okay, if I can never get away with, from these structures, then I really need to learn how to relate to them and integrate them in a, in a healthy, conscious way that is sort of balanced with the whole. Um, and I think it's, it's a great kind of... Um, it's just as a general orientation, it's really helpful to see them that way. It's just, they're all co-present. Um, we really need to learn the story of, of awakening consciousness, right? And know that all of those steps along the way are still stepping. They're still walking. They're still walking with us, right? The magic's still here. We're just ta we're talking about it right now and listening. That's the magic. Um, but, you know, integrating it in a conscious way, that's the challenge. That's the difficulty, I think. The inter integral endeavor is how do, do we, what is, the, what is the best way to do that, to be present for these structures and integrate them? Um, I don't think there's any singular way, but that's always the question. Yeah, and the global answer is shadow work. See what mm -hmm. has been pushed into the shadow and which is worth getting it out again because it has some vital function for our lives uh, for individuals and for the collective you know mm -hmm. so i i do think that it's uh, basic to to heal i would always like to to use the the term healing healing mm -hmm. our past uh, personal and also collectively the these moments where things went suboptimal let's say yeah. <laughs> it, it really helps to see that that way um to really kind of see these transformations as traumatic upheavals and because you know we're, we're only human <laughs> we're gonna mess it up along the way and yeah the transformations are you know um McLuhan talks about them as these kind of uh thunder strikes these kind of thunderbolts that shake the world, that, that shake the city in Finnegan's Wake. There's just a series of them. And then Gebser talks about it too, that, you know, um, in, in the sort of the beautiful kind of storytelling with mythic storytelling, he's describing the birth of Athena as a sort of expression of the emergence, the eruption of the mental. And Athena, you know, breaks through Zeus's head. She's birthed fully armored, fully clothed, right? With a spear 
breaks through Zeus's head. What a migraine, just like crashes right through. And, and her birth disrupts all of the cosmic cycles. The sun stops moving out in its circle. The sun is even interrupted by this. So there's this kind of, whoa, what just happened? Um, there's a shock to each of these things. And I think that shock is something that we need to heal. Like we need to, yeah, okay, the whole world just shut down and now we're in this new world and now we're figuring out how to be mental beings. And hey, weren't we doing a thing in the past with this whole mythic magic thing? I don't know, whatever. So, so there's this kind of sense of loss and disconnection through these shocks, these sort of eruptions and transformation. And um, it's good to have humility about it. You know, like we live through these things and then it takes some time to integrate them again. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy growth to goodness kind of thing that's been critiqued, you know, the growth to goodness fallacy. Um, there are, tr we trip up along, along the way. You know, if there are, if this is a stairway and I don't really see it that way myself, but even if it were, we've fallen on the stairs a few times going up, you know, Absolutely. and we've gotten a little bruised, so. And it's a, it's a wrong idea to think that development is easy and that mm -hmm. life is easy personally and also in the, in, in the collective. It's not easy. I think it is always a sort of a, a struggle and especially in these moments of disruption or disruption, yeah. uh, as, it, as you mentioned at the beginning, is now. We are now in this time where everything is sort of breaking down or some people try to keep it up still but it's sort of obsolete others want to find new ways and insecure how it will be many tempta mm -hmm. temp not temptations tentatives to to find solutions and it needs time and then at the end we will see which which comes out it's the same thing in personal uh, breakdowns you know you when something really bad or disruptive happens, you cannot just the next day pretend things go on as, as usual, they don't. So you need the time to, to integrate, to, re, to reinvent yourself in many ways. And I think that's what we do as a society at the moment, at least in the Western world, but I think now in the whole world in some way, they are all in different areas still of, of uh, finding their, their space. But uh, I think the disruption is everywhere um, mm -hmm. visible. So we will see. We have to just keep the, I don't want to say hope, keep the good intention and keep the, the learning from the past that these big disruptions have happened already several mm -hmm. times. With horrible things, the industrialization, industrialization, how many people died and, uh, you know, had a miserable life. But at the end, we are here now on the internet, you know, which uh, is basically because of that, because technology began to, to evolve and get better and better and better. So every developmental jump has a big cost and has also a big advantage. And I think in our culture today, and let's say in the green de uh, developmental culture, we think everything is easy, and it's not. We need to, and this creates then the, the, the anger and the resentment, because we think it should be easy, but it's not so, oh, you know. And when we individually could understand that's not easy, and that it's demanding a lot of everybody of us, but it has a sense, why we sh a meaning, why we should do that and why we do it at the end. Or you can refuse to do it, but I don't think it's a better place where you're in then. Uh, then it would be probably easier. But we cannot stop it, that's for sure. No, we can't stop it. Um, yeah, there's, there's elements here too with um, the kind of runaway forces of technology that I think we can get some insight from. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, you know, it's this idea that we, these upheavals are difficult, not only because the world is getting, falling apart. Um, and it's not that we all want a new world. We're not even sure what the new world is at this point. So part of this, and this is why we're scared right now is, well, I don't want everything to fall apart yet. You know, like, yeah, sure. I want a better world. And I know this one has problems, but 
what are we going to stand on if this world falls apart? That, it's that abyss between the two and living in an age of transformation. That's, that's really the shock. It's this, we still are perspectival mental beings in terms of Gebser's um, descriptions. You know, we're still in this perspectival world. And I think we can have some empathy with that in that like, yeah, it's going to be, we're going to, we're tearing ourselves off, you know, it's like the, the tarot card, the tower, you know, we're falling from, we're falling from something in that, in that midst of transformation. So there's a terror in letting go. And there's all of these kind of bargaining things, right? Where we're trying to go, well, we can keep the mental, we can keep the perspectival as is if we just kind of make it a little bit easier on the environment, or we can keep capitalism as it is, as this unlimited growth factor, if we just kind of check it a little bit at the top. Like, n no, none of these things, like, first of all, we're not even able to do that anymore. You know, everything's run away. Um, so yes, I think there's a sense of, of um, the dissolution aspect is scary because we don't know how to replace all of these systems as they're falling apart. We're trying to build the bridge under us as it's, as, as you know, we're w running across this cliff. Um, so that's the scary thing. Um, and then with, with the mental, I, I, you know, I find it really interesting as a sort of a side note too, with what Gebser was talking about in terms of industrialization. So many authors have talked about this. Like you can talk about like Kevin Kelly. Um, he's like this tech, he calls himself a techno philosopher. He's one of the founders of Wired. And um, he, I think he's a reader of Tehard. I, I'm pretty sure because he's, He's, he's hinted at it. I think he's mentioned Tarot a few times, a mega, a mega point. Um, but his whole thing, he sort of has a technological view of this, but he views technology as a force of nature. He says, no, the principles of tech are synonymous with the principles of, of uh, the natural world in terms of like evolution, things like that. Um, and he has an old book called um, Out of Control. Oh, sorry. I have to I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, so um, like I was mentioning, the, I was talking about Kevin Kelly and the sort of runaway technology phenomenon as, a, as this kind of force of nature. And I find this really interesting because Tehard talks about this, um, that there is this pull, this energy, this dynamism in the universe that's drawing us towards it, right? For, for Tehard, it was a spiritual principle of the omega point. But for Kelly, it's this kind of technological life principle. I'm not really sure where he comes down on in terms of the the cosmology but um all this kinds of reminds me of something that many modernist writers have talked about this phenomenon of time and history that history is kind of this runaway force right um walter benjamin the the uh jewish german uh, sort of critical theory scholar he was part of that sort of early sort of frankfurt school um kind of early kind of postmodern thinker in terms of looking at history. Um, you know, uh, he's been very you know, well read and studied by I think uh, a lot of secular academics, but he has this kind of potently beautiful expression of this sort of sweeping energy of history when he's talking about in a fragment, one of his little um, poetic fragments. Uh, called, it's in a chapter called uh, Thesis on the Philosophy of History, um, where he's interpreting Paul Klee's painting of um, the new angel. I think it's called uh, An Angel Novist or something along those lines. And he interprets this image of, of Paul Klee's angel kind of holding history. And he's saying, you know, this is the angel um, from the garden and history that the winds in this painting, you can kind of see this motion and the angel is facing kind of this way and trying to like hold something it's trying to like contain something, but everybody's getting blown away. And he's, you know, he's describing it in a very kind of beautifully tragic spiritual way that, you know, history has swept creation forward and there's nothing that can stop it. There's this divine wind blowing in from heaven and the angel wants to restore Eden, but it can't. And that history is just this kind of, again, Benjamin was, was, was living through the World War II. So history is this, catastrophe of, 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 of exploding progress and new levels of catastrophe and everything's sweeping forward and there's no way to stop it. That kind of anxiety about history and time is something that interests Gebser as well. And, and, and Gebser recommends that we look at this as a kind of 
tension between the mental and the integral, right? That the mental is this sort of capacity that we've been talking about to measure, to divide, to focus on the eye, to spatialize reality. And so with the kind of um, the emergence of the integral, the integral is this kind of wholeness. It doesn't, it doesn't need to spatialize. This one aspect of it. It's this kind of beautiful intensity um, where time is no longer linear either. Time is more like this kind of acoustic space. It's this multidimensional whole. Um, but the mental doesn't get it. And, and, and it really wants to master time and reality on its own terms. And it's unlocking all of these forces, all these new innovations of technology, all of these, you know, these new discoveries of space. But since reality is bigger, it's always breaking open these systems. So we have these kind, this kind of rush of industrialization um, in kind of the advancement of modernity that gets faster and faster and faster. And then we start to have these revolutions at the same time. It's kind of, um, Gebster puts it this way. And I think, again, he kind of relates to Kevin Kelly in the sort of techno view um, that both, uh, <laughs> both the revolution as a concept and the machine have become emancipated. Emancu means like out of the hand. It's out of our hands. We feel that history as a sort of social force of like progress and, and freedom and revolution, sometimes violent, sometimes peaceful, um, has, has run out of our control. And But then so has the machine. The machine has its own kind of autonomy almost. We seem to almost be, like McLuhan describes, like uh, the, the, these sort of procreative organs of the machine world. So there's a sense that everything has sort of run out of our control. For Gebser, he's saying like, that's only from the mental. Like, you know, if we could embody this and be present in this as integral beings, then we don't necessarily have to feel like everything is out of control. We can begin to embody an intensified consciousness that can hold the whole. Um, and until we do that, and yeah, the systems are gonna blow apart and time is gonna keep speeding up and technology is going to keep advancing and creating these kind of destabilizations. So for him, it's this kind of, um, he calls it the eruption of time as this kind of lived phenomenon that we all experience living as moderns. Um, and, and I really like that as a term because it really kind of puts the finger on what we experience today, especially today with the internet and how every, every couple of years our technology is changing. Um, you know, we've gone through the Arab Spring and Occupy in this decade, you know, and just all of these things that have happened in, in, in America recently for the past few years are, worldwide, we really feel that there's this kind of destabilization happening because things are changing so fast and we don't know if we have control over that. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there as this kind of, okay, how do we relate to the present and how do we kind of connect some of these very beautiful abstract ideas into the, 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 the anxieties of being a modern person in this sort of techno developmental world? Um, Gebster's kind of pointing at like, well, we need a leap. There's a kind of a leap in consciousness that needs to take place. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop rambling now. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree totally. I can also understand the development of technology and as a natural thing, because um, from early times on, humans looked for some tools to, to, to survive better. And this has come from a stone to open a nut to internet and and zoom meetings or whatever you know so that's it's a natural thing and i, I, I in the the push i agree totally that the push uh, into something new is seems to be the law of this existence here on 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 our planet maybe on others too i don't know maybe on the whole universe i i don't know but at least here and in us humans and so the question how can we meet this craziness which is going on you say it's a the time is getting different quicker 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 and at the same time sort of standing still in some way you know i don't know how to how to name that and for me it's always the um the inner aspect now which comes into it we we need as humans find a way and i find it really difficult to be to remain calm and to not get overwhelmed in your psyche and we are sort of getting crazy individually you know because we we jump on every new uh, uh, request or every new possibility every new toy and so on 
So I think it's, it's a call for the individuals to, to learn how to self-regulate in a way which is not overwhelming us completely. That doesn't mean go back to, you know, to only work in your garden and grow your own vegetables, which is a good thing too. But how to conserve the broader perspective and the knowledge of being in this time of the world, contribute to your part and still don't go out of your mind, you know. And I think that is everybody's personal challenge. Mine is for sure, you know. So yeah. um, the, for me, that's the only way we can, we can uh, come out of the crisis, individually yeah. uh, bringing ourselves to the level where we can meet it. Yeah, there's um, for me as well. I think it's it's this principle of and the value of presence and being present. And there's a lot in that capacity that's underestimated. And, and we, I think, a lot of people in the integral community probably feel um, that they have a good handle on some form of tradition, some kind of praxis. But I think just the very idea of being present and what capacity the present actually has to hold that complexity and to respond to that complexity and intense pressure and overwhelmingness with the appropriate action or non-action. You know, there, there's a time for doing and not doing. And I think being present and the intelligence of the presence has this capacity to help direct that a little bit or not direct it. You know, it doesn't have to be a mental direction moving forward. Sometimes it's just a kind of a being. Um, and, and I think we just need that capacity more and more, especially today, especially today. Where what, what I like what you say, that. the intelligence of presence, because also being present all the time is not the, the solution. You cannot be present to everything which is around you. So you need to have a intelligence and the choice to to what you are present and then how is your attitude to what you are present and what are you making out of that and i think really we need to we need to learn that and the other thing we need to learn is um you were talking about relating coming together uh, again as uh, overcoming the uh, 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 how do you say it? the division between people everybody is doing their own thing that was always my a deep belief that we need in intimate couples, we need to learn, first of all, how to come together and how to create a peaceful, peaceful relationship. Doesn't mean that we don't quarrel, but uh, cultivate a, a way how to find understanding, you know, and how to deal with conflict, how to, how to be oriented to the bigger good which we have together and when we can do that in the intimate relationships which means also family and and not only your partner then we can go out into the world and try to make uh, peace because for me uh, not having it realized in yourself and going out and want it from the world that the world is different it's sort of a little bit I don't know, not, <laughs> not a good idea. So the old uh, saying is be an example yourself, you know. So that's for me the, the, the basic tool for to keep up uh, with the time and even to create a positive change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, this is something I think we, we've, we learned from any of the integral expressions and it's, it's that capacity to be as you know we talk about an integral being aware of the shadow as I was mentioning before that to sort of take back these projections uh, in the world and, and um, one of the phrases Gepster has for it that I really like is, is this idea of what we shout out into the forest is what we receive back yeah and he's saying, well, this is, this is an integral. If, if we are integral, then we will receive the integral world. You know, there's this kind of, again, that hearkening, that hearing is very important. What are we shouting out? Let's listen to that. That'll give us insight into ourselves. So we can never kind of go out and expect the world to give us a thing. 
it always has to come from within and things that we are receiving from without they're always a, a a challenge for us to bring back into ourselves and go okay why did i receive that kind of negative response what is, what is what am i putting out to to create this kind of feedback um it may not be too personal in relationships it very is it's very often a personal thing and very difficult thing to kind of really see what you're putting out um with these systemic issues it's it's a kind of a sharing um you know that this this whole debate right now and in, a, in media about, okay, do we go out and fix the world as a lot of people and activists are saying without helping ourselves? Well, I think we need to really do both. Like James Hillman talks about this. Um, he has a book called, uh, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world is still falling apart or something along those lines. And that's his question. Um, what's going on between the individual and the society? The individual is sick. But then so is, so is the culture. So it's kind of seeing this continuity um, between the two. And I think that's, that's certainly important as well. Um, not just sort of the individual, but also kind of as a term of a praxis, then yes, you should always be relating everything back to who you are. Um, but as, as the society as a whole, that's an opportunity to master yourself and then take it back out. Um, that's an opportunity to go like, I have, I really get what I'm doing about this whole mental perspectival dividing thing. I've really kind of grokked how I'm personally enacting that. I've really integrated that into myself. And that's what I'm putting out into the world. So I can make now this opportunity to change that and to find new ways to relate um, as a human being, being present with other human beings. And I think that's really profound that that has so much more of an impact than talking about integral concepts in a very kind of mental way, like let's argue and let's fight on the internet about it. Like you're not really enacting it in a deep way if you're doing that, you know? Um, so again, it, there's always this kind of dynamic in this flow between the self and the world or what's, you know, that's sort of echoing back. So. We are almost at the end, but what comes to my mind saying uh, to be more present for other human beings, that makes me think about the masculine and feminine approach feminine approach to life is much more being there for other human beings, while masculine approach is much more seeing what is out there and what can I do. And it's not by chance that I think that we women come out of the closet and unfortunately first try to become better men. But uh, finally, maybe we find a feminine way to give a counterpart, the one we were talking about to the over... Um, a saturation of, of what you call the, the mental. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we are not mental, but uh, this uh, attitude is, is when we really find out what a feminine approach to life is, which we don't know yet collectively, mm -hmm. uh, I think it is needed to counterbalance. And it's also more the listening part, you know, because the, uh, the mother is listening when, when she has the child in, in her belly. She is listening to that. You know, she cannot see it, but she is listening. So I think the feminine approach is much more into listening and less into doing it. That is a hypothesis I have, and I, I've seen it in several, uh, you know, examples. But I do think that we have still to, to work on that quite a bit. And especially we women, we, are, we thought that the masculine approach would be the real good one, you know, and we should try to do that too. And that has first brought us in the wrong direction, in my opinion. And, and it will still take time until we find a true femininity <laughs> in our society. And, you know, but, and you will, a uh, masculine uh, way will change by, in, in the same degree as we will find our own voice. So, but we are still far from that, I would say. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hopefully that w this century will bring some <laughs> improvement also in that. I hope so. I really do. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's um, whatever the integral world is, you know, we, we've, the mental is, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's completely synonymous with the male gender, but, you know, the image of, the, the the menace meaning wrath going forth on a battlefield it's a very it has a very kind of aggressive male aspect um 
and that's okay. There, you know, as, as, you know, probably Jung would say, there's a masculine feminine counterpart in us. Um, even if you take this sort of mythical approach that the polarities are complementarity, you know, there, there's, there's a balancing in the mythical in the mental, they're a little bit more either or kind of oppositional in the integral. I think it's, it's this kind of co-presence, you know, okay. You know, there's, there's masculine and there's feminine ways of relating and being in the world that are more, some are more directive and aggressive and spatial. And then others are more a different kind of space, a sort of relational listening. Um, the mythical and the magical were, were better at that. Um, I don't know if that equates or translates into, well, those societies were matriarchal. I think there's some evidence in, in prehistory for some of that, but the question is how do we bring that all forward and, and present? All of it, all of it, all, the mental, magical, mythical, the feminine and the masculine, all of it's like wonderfully, magically, overwhelmingly becoming present in the present. And it is overwhelming. But I think the good news is, is what we've been saying is, is there's an intelligence in this presence and presencing that can help inform what that right, right relationship will be. We don't know what it is yet. There's a creative principle in all of this too, in the integral structure and this sort of um, you know, as Gepser says, presence is creative. Origin is, is creativity. So the mutational process is a creative process of being present with what wants, what's latent. And I think this is what's latent. What we're hinting at here is, is this kind of world to come that's somehow present in, in this conversation and that wants to kind of spring forth. So I'm just excited that we're, <laughs> we're going to be able to do that. And we are doing that um, yeah. as, as overwhelming as it can be sometimes. So yeah, it's very hopeful, very positive note to the end of our yeah. conversation. I really do like that. And I thank you very much for your availability to talk about that. And we will continue in the future. Okay. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for having me here. <laughs>